Hello everyone, thank you for joining us for today's edition of Akoya Academy. In today's edition of Akoya Academy, we will review the codex technology and see for the first time how Surat, a commonly used single cell analysis package in R, can be utilized to analyze codex data. Before we jump into the details of the analysis, let's first review the codex technology. Codex was designed to address the need for multi-marker spatial analysis of cells and tissue. So what's driving this need? Well, there's two general categories. There's a resource perspective, and then there's our biological or discovery perspective. From a resource perspective, we have limited tissue samples that may make tissue biopsies the most viable option for our discovery studies. And because of this limited sample supply, we want to extract as much information as possible out of our precious tissues. Now, Codex enables us to do that by assaying up to 60 markers in a single tissue in a single experiment. From a discovery perspective, we recognize that tissues are comp com um, composed of a diverse group of cells. and We may need several markers to identify a single cell type in tissue. In the case of cancer research, we want to phenotype immune cells, tumor cells, cells in the tumor microenvironment, and thus we require a high level of multiplexing. We also know that spatial phenotypes and cell-cell interactions affect biological outcomes, and to understand the biological mechanism at work, we require single cell resolution. With single cell resolution, we can identify these critical cell-cell interactions and cell neighborhoods that are drivers for these biological outcomes. So let's see how the Codex technology works. Codex is enabled by its basic chemistry, where each antibody in the panel is conjugated to a unique oligonucleotide barcode. The tissue is stained with the entire antibody panel in a single step, during each imaging cycle, three reporters, these dye-labeled oligos, bind to their complementary barcodes and give out a fluorescent signal. So here's the first step of the codex workflow. We're going to prepare and stain tissue with codex antibody in a single step. At this point, all of the antibodies are bound and fixed to the tissue. So how do we find where the target antibodies have bound to their um, antigens inside of the tissue? Well, we're going to, review, to use the reveal step to reveal where our antibodies have bound to their target antigens. Now in the reveal step, these oligo-bound fluorophores, or codex reporters as we call them, are going to hybridize to the reverse complement that is conjugated to the antibody. We're then going to record where these reporters have bound by imaging the sample, and then we're going to remove these reporters so that we can repeat the process over again. In this way, we're able to capture all of our markers using codex. Now the codex solution is comprised of three main components, codex reagents, fluidix control, and codex software. Let's take a look at codex reagents. Our reagents are available a la carte for flexibility and include kits and reagents, so these are essentially all the buffers and reagents you need for tissue staining, custom conjugations, and performing codex experiments. There's the codex antibodies that are conjugated for antibodies. Um, these, excuse me, the codex antibodies are codex conjugated antibodies for building antibody panels. The codex reporters are fluorophore conjugated oligos for visualization of the codex antibodies. And then the codex barcodes are activated oligos for easy conjugation of custom codex antibodies. Now there's three categories of codex antibodies. There are the codex inventoried antibodies. These are the antibodies that are validated and sold as a complete assay by Acoya. There are the codex screened antibodies that are tested for barcode and reporter compatibility. These are not sold by Acoya and user conjugation is required. So you would get the barcodes from Akoya and source the antibody elsewhere. And the Codex community antibodies are tested and shared by Codex users, but not tested or sold by Akoya. So again, user conjugation is required. So here's some examples of Codex compatible antibodies that we have. These would be validated or screened antibodies
that Akoya has tested. And you can see that we have antibodies for human fresh frozen tissue, mouse fresh frozen tissue, and human FFPE tissue. Now these lists are ever growing. So if you'd like to know if your antigen is on this list now, please reach out to us and we can connect you with the appropriate person for that question. And if you don't see this tissue on, your, on this list here, please don't be discouraged. Um, we might have some experience with that tissue. So again, if you don't see your targets listed here, please reach out to us. So the next step of the codex solution is the fluidics control. And this includes all of the automation that's necessary to run both the fluidics of the instrument as well as the microscope. So the codex integrates with the microscope as shown here. The fluidic lines lead to the uh, stage and the custom insert holds the tissue specimen and integrates with the microscope stage. The tissues are sliced onto cover slips and stained offline and they'll fit between these two gaskets here. Again, this whole apparatus, this codex insert sits on the stage of the microscope. So let's see the entire workflow in a single slide. We're going to section our tissue and stain it with a cocktail of oligo barcoded antibodies. We're then going to put our cover slip in a codex insert and place that on the microscope stage. You can see the fluidic lines going to the codex insert. Now all of the reveal image and repeat steps are going to happen online while the insert is on the microscope stage. So that's where all of our revealing of our target antibodies is going to happen through codex automation that's controlling both the fluidics and the microscope. So the only manual step in this whole process is really the staining of that cover slip. All of the other reveal image and remove steps are automated by the codex fluidics and the microscope automation. Here we're showing a one centimeter squared uh, tissue that's been stained with 41 markers. This is human tonsil tissue. And this illustrates how large tissues can be imaged with codex. And in this case, we're only showing six of the 41 markers because showing all 41 would essentially lead to a totally white image. Here I'm showing in red CD19 for B cells and green CD3, uh, excuse me, in red CD19 for, for B cells, in green CD3 for T cells, and we have the other colors here, uh, CD15 for granulocytes, and CD38 for plasma cells. Now, um, this, this illustrates that not only can we image large tissues with codex, but we can image them with single cell resolution as this um, lower right hand corner shows you that we can resolve single cells inside of codex. We're often using a 20x objective to capture our cells with single cell resolution. So let's talk about the codex software that's going to be used not only for the automation of the instrumentation, but more critically for us in this presentation today, um, the analysis. So focusing on the analysis, after the uh, images have been acquired through codex automation, we're then going to segment cells. And cell segmentation allows us to extract features from the images that can be then used to help us phenotype the cells inside of tissue. So for each of the cells inside of tissue, you can see that in the table here, cells one through 54,000, et cetera, we have a spatial dimension for each cell, so X and Y coordinate. And we also have an integrated signal intensity for each cell across all codex parameters. And these codex parameters are the different antibodies that you have stained with. So we have the cytometric composition and the spatial coordinates so that we can see uh, what cell types we have in tissue and where they're located relative to one another. So now let's take a look at how we can utilize this cell segmentation table inside of Codex MAV and then pass these data to Surratt to perform our clustering and eventually cell neighborhood analysis. So what I'll do is I'll open up Codex MAV here and I'll open an experiment. So I'll select the experiment and we're going to open our Codex experiment. <clears throat> 
selected in the processed folder. And once our experiment opens, we're then going to visualize our nuclear stain, so that's going to be DAPI. Of course, we could visualize other markers here as well, such as uh, pancytic keratin, CD8. CD4. Increase the intensity so we can see it from a distance a little bit better. And maybe we'll turn on CD20 as one of the other markers just to get a visual on some of the markers that we've stained with here today. So these are some of our markers inside of our tissue and it's great to um, go through and make sure that all of your markers have stained well in this step before you export the markers to um, Surat for clustering. We want to make sure that we've got good quality data going in. And that's actually the purpose of this entire first step is to have a look at our data. And one of the ways that we uh, curate our data before exporting to uh, clustering is to look for the segmentation and to make sure that we don't have any false segmentation in the imagery. So what I'm going to do now is to uh, navigate to my ImageJ tools and zoom in so that I can see whether or not I have any false segmentation. And false segmentation would be segmentation in regions of tissue uh, where I have any, um, any black area. So just to focus on that, let's turn off these markers. So here we can see that I have pretty good segmentation, not a lot of false segmentation, but let's go forward as if we were going to remove false segmentation from this image. Um, in this case, I know from experience that we don't have false segmentation here, um, but I will show you how to remove it if you do have it in a sample. So here we have DAPI versus frequency with frequency on the y-axis and DAPI on the x-axis. So this is the intensity and the count of cells with that intensity. If we had false segmentation in this image, it would be visible on this left-hand side. Um, I'll purposely exclude some cells over here just to show what happens if we don't choose all cells for clustering. I've selected or gated my cell population to take forward, and I'll name this POP1. Add this as a population. Okay, and now my cells are identified as being part of this POP1 population. Now in order to um, cluster these cells in Surat and to calculate cell neighborhoods, we're going to highlight the cell population POP1 and export. We can go ahead and give this a name, and I'll just call this Surat Demo. And so then we have our analysis successfully saved, and we're going to export both our FCS and CSV files. Okay, so our CSV files have been exported. So we're all set. The next step is to um, analyze our data with uh, Surat to compute uh, clustering, and then to go into our next scripts, which are from the Coordinated Cell Neighborhoods paper and calculated... Um, excuse me, the Coordinated Cell Neighborhoods paper by the Nolan Lab and calculate cell neighborhoods for this sample. And so what we'll do is we'll access R and, whoops, need to log back into the computer here. Okay, so we actually have all these scripts pre-written and all I need to do is to open my appropriate libraries and access the path. We're going to knit, knit the markdown document to execute it. And all the user inputs that you need are um, going to be GUI driven. So you'll see a bunch of pop-ups asking for information. So let's run all and you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, so we're opening the libraries.
All right, so now it's going to ask for our single cell data from Codex. And so those single cell data are located inside of our experiment file. Here we're using the example data set from MAV, the processed folder, segmented data, segment one, FCS compensated. MAV is always going to export your single cell data to this location, so we can say okay. Now we need to type in the name of the, um, the name of the saved file. So let's type in Surat demo. We'll then choose the number of nearest spatial neighbors for the cell neighborhoods calculations. We'll explain what this is later on. And finally, the number of cell neighborhoods we want to calculate. Okay, so this script is going to go forward and perform all of our um, clustering and cell neighborhood calculations. We won't need to do anything more with this. Um, we're actually going to spend most of the rest, the rest of our time inside of MAV importing those clusters. So let's go ahead and do that now. So let's go ahead and we don't need this population anymore. And turn off the segmentation. Let's go to File, Import Clustering Run. Navigate to the clustering run and say open. Let's confirm that the clustering folder is correct. And we'll choose cluster ID as the correct column for where the cluster IDs are located. Okay, so we can see here that we have um, 18 clusters, and then one more cluster ID of 1,000, which are those three cells that were excluded. Um, I mentioned that I would leave a few cells off of the data. Um, here, those three cells were labeled with a cluster ID of 1,000, just to let you know that these cells were uh, not part of the clustering one, they were excluded, um, but for the purpose of accounting for all the cells, they've been included in, in the final results. Um, so what we can do now is to see what went into these calculations. So let's review some of the specifics of, of the uh, Surat calculations that went into, went into making these clusters. So we have the first step, which is actually um, a null step, but I wanted to include it just so that those of you that are familiar with Surat could uh, see what's happening. So we're actually going to skip this normalized data step. This normalized data step takes advantage of normalization for unique molecular identifiers. We don't have that with our data since we're not using RNA, we're using protein. Um, and this step is not, is not relevant. We are going to scale our data um, so that we can see what is highly expressed and what is weakly expressed in terms of antigen expression on cells. We'll take those antigens, which are row names of the Surat object, which is codex, and name them as all features. We'll then calculate PCA, find neighbors for clustering, calculate clusters where resolution determines how many clusters are output. So here, um, the higher the resolution, the greater the number of clusters. I think two would be about the highest that I would go. We'll assign clusters to uh, variables so that we can read them back into MAV, which we've already done now. And lastly, we'll run UMAP. So let's go ahead and uh, now that we've reviewed what calculations went into the clusters, let's see what tools we have to analyze these data now that we've imported our clusters back into Codex MAV. Well, we have a heat map, which has all 18 of our uh, clustered populations. And we have a ridge plot, which also shows the clustered populations going from for each marker, we have the cluster starting from the top, which is the lowest expression, and the bottom, which is the highest expression for that target marker in each cluster. So for CD8, we have three clustered populations, 0, 7, and 9, that have the highest expression of CD8 positivity. And our uh, heat map can be read by looking at each of these antigens and seeing that if it has lots of bright yellow lines, then we know there is a high frequency of high expression. In the case of ID01, we have a lot of um, black lines and a few yellow lines, which means that only a few cells have very high expression of ID01 inside of cluster 0.
We have the other two populations, population 7, which has a lower intensity of CDA expression, but approximately the same frequency, and um, population 9, which also has lower intensity of CDA expression. And the ridge plot really helps us see the differences in, in intensity between these um, different clusters. So these tools together are very useful for um, identifying um, phenotypes inside of inside of the tissue. We can also leverage the the UMAP to see uh, where, what these phenotypes might be. So if we can't determine from the heat map and the ridge plot alone what these phenotypes are, then we can look to the UMAP to see um, our, our different populations. And so in this case, we have CD4 expressed in this left-hand side of the UMAP. And so we would expect clusters 3 and 4 to be CD4 populations. Now inside of um, Codex MAV, we have the ability to see another heat map, which tells us a lot of the same things that the Surratt heat map told us, but in a little bit different way, where we have a dendrogram on the left-hand side, and then the intensity of the target marker for each cluster um, displayed here, where bright red is high intensity and uh, white is low intensity. So let's take a look back at Codex MAV now and see how we can utilize all these tools together to analyze our data. So as I mentioned, we have this heat map inside of Codex MAV. Here I'm going to scale by populations and turn on the row dendrogram so we can see the uh, most similar populations here. And let's take a look, for example, at how we might use this, this dendrogram to identify similar clusters. So we see that these two clusters, uh, cluster ID 15 and 6, are very similar because the lines are connected. And we see that they're both uh, CD4 cells, but one population has very low or no expression of CD11C, and the other population has high expression of CD11C. So if we go into the uh, folder that contains the Surratt images, and let's just navigate to that really quick so you can see it. So we'll go into our folder that contains the images that's on the desktop. And this example data set for MAV. Go into figures. So we can see all of our uh, various plots for this uh, sample are listed here, for this experiment are listed here. We can access the heat map. And so this folder is automatically generated when we ran the R script. Okay, so if we look at uh, cluster ID uh, 15 and cluster ID 6, cluster ID 6 we can see um, has the CD45, CD44, CD4, and CD11C. And then if we go to cluster uh, 15, we can also see that we have, um, you know, that lack of expression of, of CD11C, but we do have some expression of, of CD4 here. We also have um, high expression of Vimentin. So in, in combination of using both of these, both of these um, heat maps, we can really have a lot of tools at our disposal, along with the UMAP and the ridge plot, to help us phenotype the cells in this population or in this tissue. So what do I do when I want to uh, phenotype these cells and visualize them? Well, let's go ahead and click on population six, for example. This was our, this was our um, population that had CD11C positivity as well as um, some CD4 positivity. So we'll add that as a population. And we can also add uh, population 15. So let's just annotate this one really quick. So we'll call this 6. And we can do the same thing with Actually, I think I, I, that's 15. Let's go back and change that to 15. OK. And make this one uh, 6. Getting confused now. We're going to do this over again because I got myself nice and confused. So let's bring in 6. 
Okay. And now uh, let's bring in population 15. Okay, now we don't have to color them the same color. We can color them something different to see um, the two populations separately. Of course, we would do this for all of our clusters, not just two of them. Um, and another way that we can uh, explore our sample, I'll show you this, is to go into gating and open from FCS and actually utilize the, utilize the um, FCS file that was calculated to, to gate on our sample. So let's go ahead and do that. So if I choose UMAP1 or UMAP2 on this side for Y and UMAP1 on the X, I can see the UMAP that is in um, my presentation. And so if I, if I go to the folder where the figures were exported, I can open the feature plot up and see what markers are expressed and what portions of the UMAP. So if I look at this uh, table, I can see that CD21 is expressed over on the right-hand side of the UMAP. I can also see that CD20 have, has marker expression over here. And if we look at KI67, I also see some KI67 signal. So we would expect this right-hand side to be um, maybe our germinal centers. And so what we can do is gate on this population just to show you the functionality. If you wanted to use the UMAP to explore the data rather than just importing the clusters right away. And sure enough, we have the uh, germinal centers there. And so that's one way that we can interact with our data is by, is by gating on the UMAP as well. And we can see by population where those um, CD4 T cell populations were um, inside of the data. Okay, so now that we've done a little bit of um, phenotyping, let's go ahead and, and move on to um, showing you how we can utilize um, these, these phenotypes in combination with cell neighborhoods. So in order to import our cell neighborhoods, let's first, let's first um, archive these populations, these clusters, and then let's import our uh, cell neighborhood run. Okay, and we're going to choose neighborhood from the list. And so my eight cell neighborhoods, as well as those cells were, that were excluded, come into the clustering window. And now I can uh, add all of my cell neighborhoods to the image and utilize the clustering by dendrogram similarity to see those that are most similar. So color, color neighborhoods by those that are most similar together. And we can see the um, neighborhood composition through our neighborhood heat map. So here on the right hand side, we have the uh, cell neighborhoods and on the bottom we have our Surat clusters. And so um, cells that are highly expressed in a neighborhood show up in red and those that are weakly expressed or weakly present um, or, or a few in number inside of a neighborhood are shown in blue. So highly prevalent populations in a neighborhood are red, we, uh, lowly prevalent or, or few numbers of populations in a neighborhood are in blue. And so let's go ahead and jump ahead to the annotated, um, the annotated presentation where we can see uh, what the results of our, of our calculations are. So in this uh, spatial phenotyping with Surat clustering, I have in cluster zero, these ID1 positive cytotoxic T cells, our B cells, proliferating B cells in, in um, cluster two. And this is what we saw in that germinal center. We have CD44 helper T cells. Um, 
we have actin positive B cells. And so I won't go through all of these, but you can see we phenotyped all of our different clusters uh, inside of this heat map. We've then taken these clusters and their annotations, and um, we're going to um, then apply them to the cell neighborhoods. So before I show you those final results, let's just briefly review, review again how we calculated cell neighborhoods. So cell neighborhoods are calculated by um, creating first spatial windows. So these spatial windows are determined by the um, nearest neighbors of cells and tissue. So here I'm showing you the 10 nearest neighbors of this cell inside the tissue, and this is one spatial window. I'll do this again for another cell, and this is another spatial window. So we have these spatial windows, and we're going to cluster them to find common patterns of proximity or cell neighborhoods. And so these are the um, these patterns of proximity are what we were showing in this heat map, where we have cell neighborhood zero through seven, and we have the uh, high abundance of, for example, um, helper T cells in cell neighborhood zero, and a high abundance of epithelial cells in cell neighborhood six. But basically, this is a, a higher resolution view of the spatial patterns inside the tissue. So we're not just looking for pairwise relationships here, we're looking for combinations of cell interactions across the tissue. Now if we wanted to look at pairwise relationships, we can come back to uh, Codex Mav and let's go ahead and recover those populations that we archived. If we if we were to compute pairwise relationships in the neighborhoods, um, we would see a very obvious answer that cells are, are nearby one another because that's the definition of these cell neighborhoods. So we don't need to do that. Let's go ahead and show our archived populations, unarchive them, and let's go ahead and calculate some, some spatial relationships. I think you'll know right away what we expect our uh, relationships to tell us or what the spatial analysis is going to tell us just by the imagery here. Um, but we can go ahead and choose region one for the analysis. And we'll choose a minimum distance of three and a max distance of 30 microns uh, for this study. We could choose a different max distance if we wanted to. Um, but here we'll just use 30 as a good basis for um, the spatial calculations. So our calculations finish very quickly. And we can see here, and while we're looking at this, we can actually turn on some of our markers um, so that we can see the uh, populations. I think we used green for CD4 before. So we're gonna go ahead and turn that on. And let's go ahead and use um, CD20 was magenta and KI67 can be uh, yellow. Okay, so here we're looking at um, the pairwise uh, spatial associations for spatial proximity, and we see that cluster 6, the CD4 positive, CD11, C positive, and cluster 15, the CD4 positive population, are having a high likelihood of spatial interaction. And we can tell that just from looking at just from looking at the populations inside the imagery, of course, but it becomes more difficult to determine that as you have a, a higher number of populations. And we wanna rely on the calculations, not just our eyes. There's a low likelihood that we're going to have either of these populations in close spatial proximity with the cells at the uh, germinal center, which is what this uh, calculation tells us, but also uh, seems quite apparent from looking at the imagery. So this is how we can calculate uh, pairwise cell-cell um, relationships and cell-cell proximities inside of Codex Mav. So we've done this at length um, for a, a sample using Codex. Just going to click here in advance. There we go. Um, so we have investigated spatial interactions using codex in the sample and shown that um, red indicates high spatial interactions, a high number of spatial, uh, high likelihood of spatial proximity, and blue indicates low likelihood of spatial proximity for these populations. And so uh, we can calculate pairwise uh, spatial interactions to see what cell-cell uh, interactions are driving biological outcomes. And as I've shown you, we can also calculate uh, those cell neighborhoods to see the distribution and frequency of cell neighborhoods in samples. So 
In conclusion, um, our, our presentation here has shown that the codex system enables highly multiplexed immunofluorescence for uh, 60 markers imaging across the whole tissue or ROIs. It converts existing fluorescence microscopes into high dimensional cell analysis tools. It's compatible with both FFPE and fresh frozen samples. It does not degrade the tissue. It is compact and affordable. It is compatible with Surratt and other single cell analysis tools. And it enables the quantification of spatial association on multiple scales by providing single cell resolution to calculate cell neighborhoods and pairwise cell proximity. Okay. We're now going to move on to answering any questions that you might have. And if you have additional questions, please feel free to reach out to us via email. Okay, thanks everyone. So if you haven't already, please place your uh, questions in the Q&A. And so there were a, uh, a few questions that have come through. And so one of the questions actually was asked a couple of times was, are these materials going to be available um, offline or made available for download? And the answer to that is we will be following up um, on our blog with some materials for um, analysis that you can uh, do some of the things that we've shown here today. Um, another question that came in is how do we tell the levels of expression of the various markers inside of our study? And using this analysis, you can either use um, the heat map or the ridge plot that was shown to help determine um, the level of expression inside of a particular population. I find that's pretty useful. The um, question that was asked a few times was, is Codex MAV available for any kind of um, soft, any kind of images or is it is it limited to Codex data? And the answer to that is it's, it's limited to the format of Codex data. So you need to have a Codex experiment in order to use Codex MAV um, that said, in response to another question, it, it is a plugin for image J, so there is no license needed. So we have a question about uh, region selection. So we have the ability to um, specify regions when the, this is actually done at the beginning of the codex experiment. So the question is, how do I specify regions in the codex experiment? Can I do a whole tissue image or does it just need to be regions? And the ans answer to that is you can do either. Um, so during the setup of the codex experiment, you can either designate regions or you can choose to do the entire uh, cover slip for imaging. And in the analysis, then you can choose whether you then want to subset um, those regions or the whole cover slip for analysis um, using different ROI tools made available in image J. So another question about um, will we have access to the materials in this webinar? As I mentioned, we will follow up uh, in the blog with these materials. So another good question about um, using multiple tissue samples for, for um, integration with single cell sequencing. And so we actually have, we actually have a um, couple of other webinars that are related to those types of multi-omics that I would encourage you to um, go look at. Um, so definitely that's been, um, of great interest. And I think we have some documentation on our blog about different techniques that can be used for the, the multi-omic integration. So a great question about um, what is the data format that needs to go from taking an object that's been processed with Surat into Codex Mav? And the answer to that is we're exporting an FCS file from R and then importing that uh, FCS file into uh, Codex Mav. Another good question about um, the neighborhood analysis, and this is a part that um, was not clear, and I apologize for that. So during the presentation, I showed cell neighborhood calculations, and I actually used the um, cell neighborhood calculations from the coordinated cell neighborhoods paper out of the Nolan lab um, to calculate um, those cell neighborhoods. And those scripts are available um, on GitHub question about um, Python scripts and whether or not there are Python scripts available for the same type of work. Um, so I have done similar type of work in Python. Uh, there's a number of packages out there for Python for single cell analysis. So that's a great question. And um, I don't have the same type of um, tutorial written up uh, as I do for R, but, but certainly uh, similar tools exist in Python for that type of work if you prefer to work in Python.
So there was a question about um, autofluorescence and uh, there's two methods that we deal with autofluorescence for codex. Um, one, we actually have a webinar on autofluorescence where we show how we can leverage quenching for autofluorescence, autofluorescence removal, but we also, um, we also have background subtraction with the codex platform, which uses an algorithm to subtract out background. So that's another way that we, we deal with autofluorescence. So a question about who to reach out to if I have questions about your experiment. Um, in general, if you have questions about any of your experimentation, please reach out to support at acoyabio.com. We can then take in global requests and make sure that your inquiries are directed to the appropriate personnel. So I think there's a question about automation. And, and I think this has to do with multiple samples. So the way to handle that is if you had separate experiments done, and you wanted to combine those samples, you would have to combine them in R um, by binding the data frames. And then you would need to, to separate those data frames before export back into Codex Map. So that would require, um, have, have some sep separate scripts written for that kind of work. Actually, this example was just a single slice of tissue. Um, but certainly that's possible. When you start to get into that realm of activities, it, it's good to have some knowledge to go above and beyond. Um, oh, it, it, it's good to uh, have some knowledge of R so that you can, um, so that you can uh, work with the data appropriately. And apologies, uh, just to repeat that question, there was an ask of, is there an automated way to do this for multiple slides? So another question came in about, can we visualize markers that are in low abundance using codex reporters? And the answer to that is yes, you can use codex to detect um, low expression markers. We do have recommendations on help.codex.bio of what fluorophores use for the appropriate markers. So um, please do consult on that resource. Then if you have additional questions, um, if you're using codex currently, please reach out to support at acquayabio.com so that you can make sure that you're up to date with our current recommendations for antibody clones and um, appropriate reporters. So um, there was a question today about what the sample was that was used in order to, in order to um, analyze, um, excuse me, what, what was the tissue we used today? And this was human tonsil, uh, FFPE. Okay, and there's a number of other questions related to related to um, multi-omics. So I think a good place to, to go for questions related to multi-omics is our website and look at our blog. And that's where we have um, some recent updates to the multi-omics webinars and additional details around the methods that are used for multi-omics. And I think that wraps up um, just about all of the questions um, that we have here. Um, before we wrap up, there was one more that came in. Um, so, so the question was about FFPE samples and and fresh fro frozen samples. And so, so the answer to that, um, the question is, can you work with both FFPE samples and fresh frozen samples? And the answer to that is, um, yes, we can work with FFPE samples and fresh frozen samples. Um, typically, those are done on separate cover slips, so they would be separate experiments, but certainly um, Codex can work with um, both of those sample types. And as a point of clarification, the Codex MAV is a um, free plugin for, for Fiji, and it can be found on help.codex.bio. That's our, our support website. Okay, well, thank you everyone for your time today. It looks like um, we've, we've answered most of the questions in the chat. And so um, I will be concluding the webinar. Thank you all for attending.